the circle in the center. No. Same spot. Same spot. All right, guys. Murph's here. And today, we're going to talk about this. A model of 1917 Enfield rifle chambered in the 30 caliber of 1906 30-06 cartridge. Now, in order to talk about this rifle, we are going to have to deep dive into some history, and I have quite a bit to talk about. So, if that's not necessarily something that interests you, especially since it is going to take quite a bit of this video, I'll go ahead and annotate in the description where it is that the actual review of the rifle's features and my thoughts and opinions starts at. Now, for the rest of you who are interested in the history of this rifle, go ahead and grab a drink and settle in as we get started. Now... In the early 1900s, the British decided that they wanted to change their standard rifle. They wanted to move away from the short magazine Lee Enfield platform and start looking at something more of a Mauser type influence. And they also wanted to change from the 303 British cartridge over to a 276 caliber cartridge. Now, they would continue with this, this design program up until 1914 when World War I kicked off, at which point they decided to go ahead and, and abandon those efforts and stick with the 303 British instead of having two different cartridges in circulation. Something that the, uh, uh, an outlook that the Italians would have benefited from in World War II, but that's a different subject. Now, very quickly, everyone involved in World War I would come to realize that a war of attrition did not cover just manpower, but also equipment. And as it would turn out that as they sent boys across no man's land to get mowed down by machine guns, that those weapon systems also would not make it back and would be continually guarded and pummeled with machine gun bullets. In addition to that, also artillery barrages against lines of trenches would leave a lot of rifles destroyed along with their users, which would ultimately mean that everyone would be consuming more rifles than they were putting out into the field. Now, there are a couple ways to go about rectifying the situation. Some of it was reaching deep into the storage facilities and pulling out rifles previously declared to be obsolete to push into the hands of rear echelon troops so as to free up rifles for frontline troops, or the adoption of suitable substitute rifles from either adaptations from other rifles or perhaps uh, completely different countries manufacturing. And that's the route the British would go with as they began to double down in their factories for production of the short magazine Lee Enfield. They would take this Pattern 14 rifle, as it was referred to, overseas to the Americans and see if anyone in the American arms industry wanted to take on a production contract for the Pattern 14. <clears throat> Three manufacturers answered the call. Eddie Stone, Remington, and Winchester all agreed to a cumulative two million rifle contract for the British. However, it almost immediately ran into trouble in a six month delay as the British had a had functioning proof of concept prototype pattern 14 rifles chambered in 303 British to hand off to these American companies. What they did not have were standardized measurements, tooling, or go no go gauges, which was placed entirely on the shoulders of the American manufacturers to figure out, along with expanding their factories to be able to meet the increased demand. Now, because it was handed to three different manufacturers with no specifications or technical data package to go along with it, these manufacturers each came up with their own kind of dimensions or measurements and stuff like that to utilize in the rifle. So whenever these rifles went to the British inspectors to pass muster and be accepted into British service, they would almost all be rejected under a sudden new guideline the British had come up with for what the rifles were supposed to be. Now, obviously this was causing quite a bit of friction and a lot of finger pointing between the American manufacturers and the British government. Ultimately, the British considered pulling the two million rifle contract entirely and just bending all of their resources towards short magazine Lee Enfield production, but they knew that it would also bankrupt all three companies and bankrupting arms manufacturers during a war is probably not the best idea. So what they did instead was cut the contract in half and then also loosen their standards a little bit on rifle acceptance. Now, the fact that America was going to enter the war 
1917 was becoming more and more plain every day, especially as we got closer to April 6th when war would actually be declared. And that was also apparent to the arms manufacturers in America at the time. So these three arms manufacturers who were producing the Pattern 14 approached the government with the idea of producing the Pattern 14 now chambered in 30-06 for the government. And the government liked this idea because, as it turns out at the time, they had about 600,000 Springfield 1903s and 1,600-ish Krag Jorgensons. This is not enough to make a war. Not at all. Not even slightly. And it's very surprising that we would be caught this off guard when you consider that the war had been going on for three years and already the private sector had been engaged in producing firearms of a wide variety and type for Europeans all throughout the conflict. So why had the United States government not ramped up its production as well? And a lot of this blame falls on the shoulders of a gentleman named Brigadier General Crozier, who was the chief of ordnance at the time. Now, whether or not that's actually fair or justified is a completely different conversation and video altogether. However, he plays very prominently in this 1917 story. So we were going to hear his name again before this is done. Now, the government was interested in this idea. However, they did have some specifications that they wanted to be hashed out right off the bat. And that was the interchangeability between the three manufacturers. They were not going to accept anything less than as much interchangeability as they could get. Now, that seems like a very vague statement, and it is, and it was. There were a lot of memos and meetings and standards and new standards and alternate standards that were put together during the early production years, early production months of this rifle that actually delayed production quite a bit. In fact, at one point, all of Winchester's rifles produced prior to January 1st of 1918 were declared unsuitable for overseas use and had a star stamped on their receivers for training use only. Now, there would be a lot of finger pointing during this time, and in the ensuing investigation, it would come out that the manufacturers felt that they were not getting enough and, or timely information from the United States government as to what they wanted, and that is why they were abysmally failing the interchanger, interchangeability testing that the government was doing at their own arsenals. Ultimately, this and then also some ammunition manufacturing issues that were going on at the time would get Brigadier General Crozier fired. So, whether or not it was accurate, the, the blame got placed on him. And then shortly after that, pr rifle production finally got underway with just over 2 million rifles being produced shortly after war's end. Now, this rifle would make it out to the troops for training and all that kind of stuff. And there would be some initial complaints from American troops who had any amount of experience with the 1903 Springfield, spe specific to the... Uh, type of bolt that was used as well as the sight picture. Some, including Alvin York, claiming that they preferred the more open sight picture of the Springfield 1903. Now, there would also be some issues found with the ejector and extractors breaking on these rifles. However, a suitable fix for that was never found as much as more parts were ordered. Now, ultimately, three quarters of American doughboys fighting in the American Expeditionary Force would be armed with 1917 Enfields. So, apparently they worked out pretty good. In fact, a lot of soldiers armed with these rifles actually really liked them. Now, that pretty much brings us through World War I with one more little caveat on interchangeability. When it came to firing pins, interchangeability never happened. So the firing pin had to be something that was hand fitted to the individual rifle. And as such, they were produced with a very bulbous tip that would not actually fit through the breech face so that as they went to army depots and firing pins had to be swapped out in rifles, the depot had to actually perform the hand fitting to be able to make sure that it worked with that particular rifle. Now, after World War I, with two million rifles in service at that point, there was some consideration to this becoming the new standard military arm of the United States military. However, there were a couple of issues with that prospect. The first being is that Springfield Armory and the other arsenals in the country were not necessarily geared up for production, which would have meant a massive expenditure on the tooling and then also delayed production times as 
they tried as their skilled workers tried to figure out how to produce this new rifle which would inevitably lead to rejected rifles bad batches all that kind of stuff and this was also coming at a time when spending was getting tightened down on again because now it's post-war and apparently we don't have to spend that money anymore there was another idea ventured out there of just contracting Remington, Winchester, and Eddystone to continue producing the rifles. However, the United States government did not want to give up the control of their military rifles. And that opinion would not change up until the 1960s with the M16. Now, in the interwar period, this rifle would wind up going into deep storage. Some of these would be circulated out to National Guard and Reserve units. And actually, a couple thousand would go to Mexico, as well as a 500,000 rifle contract put together for the Philippines. Now, 295,000 of those rifles would be delivered before the start of hostilities with Japan during World War II. Now, prior to the United States entry into World War II, these rifles were making their way into Europe, not directly from the government, but through second and third party groups making sure that the government was not implicated in the transport of these rifles. Several thousand would go up to Canada, several thousand would wind up in New Zealand, they would also wind up in the hands of the Danes as well as after America's entry into the war with a bunch of different guerrilla units. But the biggest benefactor or I guess I should say beneficiary of the 1917 Enfield were the British with 1 million rifles being sent and distributed between the British and Irish home guard units. Now, the 19 or the pattern 14 rifle was also in use by those units and these are two very similar looking rifles with two very different cartridges. So what was done was a red band was painted around the forestock of the 1917 Enfield to designate that it used a 30 out 6 cartridge. Now, in the interwar years, America came out with new 1903 Springfields, the A2 and A3, and in 1936 adopted the M1 Grand. However, when America entered the war, World War II this time around, in 1941, they once again found that they did not have enough M1 Grands in circulation yet. So the 1903 Springfield would still be a frontline battle implement at the beginning of the war, and so would some 1917 Enfields. And for a little bit, 1917 Enfields would persist in the use of rear echelon troops like either cannon or mortar crewmen. However, eventually these rifles would be rounded back up and brought into storage, and in 1945 they would be declared obsolete. Now, as such, these were sent out as war aid to a couple of different countries. However, they would eventually flow back in the 50s and as late as the 90s to be surplused out onto the consumer market. Now, this rifle in particular is a little bit of an interesting story. This rifle came from a friend, viewer, and subscriber of the channel who really wanted to see this put on YouTube. So I decided to oblige. Now, this has actually been passed down through the men in his family and it originated with his grandfather. Now, as the story goes, this was his grandfather's rifle in World War II. It was the rifle that was in his hands when he was wounded by a Japanese hand grenade at Luzon. And when he cycled out of military service, he brought it home with him. Now, I say that that is the story because we did not get the story directly from granddad. We got the story from family members after Granddad passed away, so how accurate the story is is open to some interpretation. However, it does not change the fact that this has been passed down from grandfather to father to son, and it is now in the hands, well, in my hands, but it belongs to the grandson of that family. Now, this rifle, when it came back with, when it allegedly came back from Granddad, in World War II, he decided to sporterize the stock, which meant that he cut down the stock and then also removed this front barrel band and bayonet lug when he did it. Now, when it made it into the hands of my friend, he decided that he wanted to return it to its former glory because it had not been changed that drastically. So he managed to find an unissued 1917 Enfield stock, slapped his barreled action into it, and then also managed to find a gentleman with a baggie of the little fiddly bits 
that belonged to 1917 Enfields and managed to get this front barrel band and bayonet combo. So he managed to return this rifle to its full glory. Now, a word of caution on this particular subject, guys. The vast majority of sporterized military surplus rifles I've run into are beyond saving. And that is either because metal parts of the gun have been altered in some manner that cannot be restored or because parts are just not available. So this is not the norm. This is the exception. All right. If you're looking at buying a military surplus rifle, you really need to spend a lot of time. That's been sporterized. You really need to spend a lot of time doing research on that rifle to make sure that you're actually going to be able to source the parts to be able to return it to its former glory. Otherwise, you're just going to wind up spending some money that you could have spent on something perhaps a little bit more useful or collectible. That's a very individual fact. That's a very individual basis on that one. I'm not telling you guys how to spend your money as much as I'm throwing out there a consideration for the expenditure of your money. Now, at this point, I think I've pretty much comprehensively covered history on this rifle, so let's welcome back our guys who jumped ahead to the actual features portion, and let's start talking about the rifle in hand. Now, this is a 10-pound rifle with a 26-inch, decently heavy profile barrel. At the end of our 26-inch barrel, we have a three-prong sight with a central blade and protective ears, which actually there's a little bit of texturing on the top of the ears, which will help break up glare in the sun, which is pretty awesome. I've actually never seen that before. It's a, nice, it's a neat little touch. Now, this sight picture is the, on this rifle, is the same type of sight picture that you would eventually see on the 1903 Springfields, the A2, the A3, that you would also see on the M1 Garand, M1 Carbine, M14, M16, and on. This has become like the de facto military sight in military arms, in American military arms history, and it started with this gun, which is kind of cool overall. Now, on our barrel, right below the front sight, is stamped the barrel's date of manufacture, which is going to give you the month and the year. And this was produced in 7 of 18, which is pretty cool. Now, another little thing about our front sight is that it is windage adjustable. However, that has to be done with a tool, be it either a hammer or a screw type attachment that would move it left and right. This is not something that you would do during battle conditions. This was a part of initially zeroing the rifle. Now coming back to here, we have our bayonet lug, which uses its own 1917 Enfield bayonet, which I would have thought that they would have wanted to use the Springfield's bayonet. However, I would assume that when we have this whole big discussion and fight back and forth about the standardization of the rifles, and already these manufacturers are going to have to provide the bayonets with the guns. It was just easier to stick with this. And then in addition to that, had it actually been produced in Springfield Arsenal, I think Armory, keep like saying that back and forth for some reason, I think they would have switched it over to the Springfield bayonet. But that's not what happened. Now here we have a stacking swivel which is meant to be able to link up a bunch of different guns so that you can keep them out of the mud. We have a handguard, full-length handguard across the top of the rifle, which is fantastic for anybody who doesn't want to burn their fingies when they're in the middle of combat. Our rear barrel band has our sling swivel, which also connects to the stock, the buttstock. Now this is the, I believe it's referred to as the Kerr type band uh, sling, which was common with the 1903 Springfield as well. However, this is not an original, it's actually a Chinese copy but I mean, it fits the bill for his purposes. Now here in the handguard, we have some finger cutouts, which helps you pull the rifle into the shoulder. It's pretty nice overall. Across the top of our breech is where we will find the manufacturer, this one being an Eddystone manufactured rifle. Now, coming back to our bolt, this is a Mauser 1893 type action with a cock on close bolt. And this would give some Americans a little bit of a fit. Anybody who had worked with the 1903 Springfield had a tendency to complain about this particular rifle, specifically with the sight arrangement and the bolt. So the Springfield 1903 is a cock on open. This is a cock on close, which requires you to put in a little bit more effort in that final 
engagement of the bolt. So that was a complaint among some troops as well as the sight picture. Now, the sights, we're actually gonna spend a lot of time on the sights right now, guys. The sight is an open aperture, which I'll actually roll in a picture to get you guys a better angle on what these sights look like. And like I say, this is the sight picture that a lot of us grew up with shooting different ARs and stuff like that. We are very familiar with it. If you've served in the military or worked around police units and stuff like that, you've probably used AR-15s or something with a very similar sight picture. And there were a lot of people who complained that they had a tendency to get confused in the heat of battle and focus on one of the protective ears as their front sight, which is just silly all on its own because you kind of got to want to do that with how the aperture so beautifully frames the front sight in, its, in the circle that it makes. Now, some people would still prefer the more open sights of a Springfield 1903, like Alvin York. However, when it comes to open, yes, this rear sight does have protective ears, but I do not feel like I lose any periphery capability. I don't, I don't feel like I get so narrowed in on the sight that I can't see what else is going around me or, or be able to properly read what's going on with my target. So I, I have trouble believing a lot of the complaints with this particular setup. Now, another complaint with the bolt is that with this kind of dog leg and very laid back, very to the rear uh, placement of the bolt is that sometimes your, sometimes the firer's finger would interact with the bolt, cause it to come up just a little bit, which would cause the rifle to not be able to fire. It would be out of battery at this point. And this, I can understand this being very irritating. However, the bolt handle does drop you off right next to the trigger, which is pretty fantastic for fast functioning of the bolt. Now, let's get back to these sights real quick. Now our aperture sight in the flush fitting is zeroed for 450 yards. Now a lot of this stems from the belief at the time that we adopted smokeless powder in these smaller bore cartridges that are going to give us greater, flatter shooting ranges and all that kind of stuff, was that combat was now going to take place at like a minimum of 400 yards. And that five and 600 yard shots were not only going to be sustainable, but the norm. And the idea was that you would have lines of troops. You'd have like two lines of troops and because you'd have rifles long enough to be able to make it so that the rear line of troops has their gun muzzle past the face of the guy in front of them so we don't accidentally shoot him in the back of the head. And then these guys are going to be able to exchange salvos of rifle fire at five, six hundred yards with opposing forces and, you know, either pick out an individual to shoot at or just shoot at the overall group. And then that was how warfare was going to be conducted. However, what no one seemed to have really taken into account when this idea was come up with were machine guns. Machine guns really shoot that plan full of holes real fast, as it would turn out, the plan and the men. Now, at the start of World War I, and this is kind of a bit of a different subject, but we are gonna go down it just a little bit. Not a lot of countries fully appreciated what a machine gun was capable of doing. The countries that did included Russia and Germany and they would quickly use their machine guns to excellent effect. And they would most definitely put this tactic right out the window, right off the bat. Now, the idea behind the 450 yard zero was that you would be able to hold on, say, a man's belt buckle, and you would still hit him somewhere up here through the vast majority of engagement distances that you might run into. That was the idea. Now the reality is, is that is saying that you have a belt buckle to aim at. That means that you're shooting at some guy standing out of the open who plainly wants to get shot. However, if your target is actually some guy hunkering down in a trench at 200 yards trying not to get shot and not exposing much more than his face to be able to fire at you, then you don't have a belt buckle to, hang, to, to aim at. You've got to pick some superfluous place on the ground to aim at in order to be able to hit this guy in the face. That kind of changes the whole fighting dynamic right off the bat. It's a, it's a big issue all throughout World War I. Now, you also note that we have a ladder type sight. Right there. And this is absolutely excellent as far as adjustment of sight goes and all that kind of stuff. Now, you'll also note that this sight is graduated out to 1600 yards. 
And this is where the vast majority of YouTubers would tell you that this is a very optimistic distance from which to engage uh, uh, something. And in all reality, you'd have to be able to identify a target at 1,600 yards to be able to engage it. This site is not meant for you to engage a single man at 1,600 yards. This is meant for your squad, platoon, company, whatever it may be, to pick a direction and a target. Somebody call out what the correction is. Everyone adjust their sight to that and then start volley firing and lobbing in bullets on that particular target. And that's basically in lieu or in addition to a machine gun. That's what that company, squad, platoon, whatever it is, is acting as at that point. And being able to get that many rifles together and place accurate fire or accurate enough fire on that particular position. This is not meant for precision type shooting. This is meant for plunging, grazing, indirect fire type methodologies. That's what that's meant for. I, I, it, it always kind of irks me hearing that. Now, if your goal is to, in fact, take this site, set it up to 1,600 yards, and then intend to engage a single man, at distance, then yes, that is a very optimistic plan. Good luck with that. Anyway, that's why they made optical sights. You can't even, I, I'm pretty sure I cannot pick out a dude at 1600. Who doesn't want to be shot? Enough about that, off my soapbox. Now on this side, we have our bolt release, which allows us to be able to disassemble the rifle or assist us in disassembling the rifle. And on this side, we have our safety. Now. In the forward position, that is fire. And then in the rearward position, it disconnects our trigger and then also locks our bolt. We just have a two position safety on this one. I do kind of wish it was on this side of the rifle just because it'd be a little more natural for the thumb to utilize, but it's not that hard to kind of come over, break your grip and, and move the safety as needed. Now, this also has a very typical British style of stock, which is very reminiscent of a semi-pistol grip, but also has a lot of straight stock type features to it. And it's pretty fantastic to get your hand in that hook and get it into your shoulder. Now, one more thing to throw out about this in this region before I move on much further. This is a six round capacity in 30-06. And that is because this was originally set up for a rimmed cartridge, and when it was switched over to a rimless cartridge, you still had a lot of space in the action to be able to fit one more round. So instead of shortening the action, they just allowed the addition of one more round. Now, strip clips still came out in five round increments, so you'd have to have loose ammunition to be able to get to six. That, that didn't really help or hurt anything at that point. Now, coming back to the rear, we have a steel butt plate, which also has a provision for keeping your cleaning kit inside of it. And that's pretty much the features of this rifle. So, how did it shoot? All right, guys, when it came to shooting this rifle, this is not my gun, and ammunition is very hard to come by, so I don't have a lot of rounds through this particular rifle. In fact, I have 10 rounds through it, and you guys pretty much have all the footage that I have for shooting of this rifle. However, I have shot other M1917s before. Overall, recoil of this rifle is incredibly light. The sight picture is absolutely excellent. It's very easy to pick up. It's very easy to work with. Now, when it comes to accuracy, we are talking about an open-sided gun, and I'm maybe not the best marksman in the world. However, in the small amount of shooting I did today, I did manage to get this 3 and 5 eighths inch group at 100 yards using Greek surplus ammunition, 150 grain FMJ. So, is it the greatest 
grouping out there in the world? No, probably not. And there's probably a ton of people in the comments section right now who are telling me how it is that they can do better, but I guess go do it, whatever. So now with all that having been said, what would I use this rifle for? Well, I have actually been actively seeking getting one of these in my collection for a very long time. And it's gonna be very hard to turn this back over to its actual owner, that is for sure. Now, as a fighting rifle, no, this is far outdated in that respect, and it's not something that I would default to as a go-to prospect of using it for self or home defense. It's entirely too overpowered for home defense. Now, a hunting rifle, I actually think that this would be a fairly fun rifle to hunt with, in all reality. It's definitely got enough power in the cartridge to take anything in North America, and there's just something nostalgic about bringing this out in the field, though the weight would not be terribly enjoyable in that regard. Now, as a kind of truck gun, preferably not, because whenever I think of a truck gun, I think of something that's more of a beater than it is something to be kind of loved and respected. But if that's how you want to spend your money, then I'm just going to sit over in the corner and cry while you do it. Now, to each their own, whatever it is that you feel is the best use for it. Now, it is not unusual, especially in a lot of European countries, to see these types of rifles pop up in competition-type use. And I can't imagine why that would be a bad setup. You can still run strip clips through this and all that kind of stuff. Like, I, I, I am actually curious if you are in a foreign country, foreign to the United States, that has the ability to be able to use these in competition, how does it work out for you? How do you see them performing out on the competition circuit? I would actually be really interested to see that. All right, guys. Well, I think that pretty much covers what I have to say about this rifle overall. I really appreciate this being loaned to the channel. This is the first time that I've had uh, anybody loan me a gun. I've had offers before, but this fella isn't going to be in the area for much longer, so I've kind of got to act on this while I can. Now, for anybody who's looking for information on these rifles, C.S. Yeah, C. S. Ferris wrote a book on the M1917 Enfield, and it's definitely an interesting treasure trove of information, though he does spend a lot of time telling you that the 1903 Springfield is zero for 547 yards. In case you didn't know. 547 yards. That's a very important fact. It's in here like 18 times on a book about a 1917 Enfield. But regardless, it was still an interesting overall read and it's where I sourced a lot of the information that I shared with you guys today. Now, I think that's pretty much what I got guys. So, have a good day.